All right. Um, the entire idea of my talk is to actually spawn infinite competition uh, because I believe that that's the best way to go about becoming the better for the space. Uh, so like how I started my own ad film production house, I would pretty much give you or at least take you through a few pointers that one could keep in mind of how one should start their own film production house. And hopefully we'll have a whole bunch of competition and I'll see you in pictures very soon. Uh, I'd like to start my talk with something that I share very, very close to my heart. Uh, the incident actually started in Singapore and I was 19 at that point of time. I was just waiting in the airport, transiting. I was doing my engineering, so I was headed off to Chennai. And while waiting in Shanghai Airport, which is absolutely a stunning airport, uh, I saw the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life. Uh, literally stunning. Like the ones that have the aura and they light up the entire room and the entire airport stops and they follow the girl through. So uh, I. I actually wanted to post her picture on it, but uh, I, for reasons that I got in touch with her and she sorts of shuns publicity. Uh, so I never included So I, I was thinking to myself that, okay, I saw the girl, so she must be from either London or Paris, and I was headed towards Chennai. Now, I had no idea what to do. So while I was walking towards the Singapore Airlines counter, I saw from just from the glimpse of my eye that she's going to follow me. As soon as I realized that she's actually following me to the same flight and she's going to take the same flight, uh, I sort of had my eureka moment of how a, a little bulb blew up on my head. Uh, so uh, luckily at that point of time, I was carrying my bass guitar around with me. Uh, it's a huge thing. So I walked straight up to the check-in baggage counter and I told her, listen, I, I cooked up this entire story saying that, listen, I'm a very poor musician, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling and I heard horrendous stories of how you guys handle instruments and in, this instrument is my life and if anything happens to it, I'm going to hijack a plane and kill everybody. And, uh, I, I meant it in jest, but, but she sort of got the idea. and. Uh, and I said that, listen, the, the organizers are really cheap and they've, they've put me up in an economy, so could you please give me a free business class upgrade? So she smiled and said, sir, luckily for you, the, the economy is full, so yeah, uh, we, we upgrade it to business class. And so uh, I, was, I was in one of the corners and, and then I, I saw that she, in, in the entire mass sea of people, I saw right through and she was somewhere, like in a whole bunch of people you look through, but you can just make out sort of a profile. Uh, at that point of time, I also had, and I still do, have this really strange habit of going to a library and going to this obscure corner of a library where there are absolutely no books that are recognizable, picking a book up and knowing not where who the author is and reading the book right in the middle from and you have no idea what, and just taking out a para. So I, I don't know this lovely, uh, this guy should be actually awarded a Nobel Prize or something. Uh, the, the, I have no idea who it is. Uh, the person actually spoke about gazes, and uh, it's, it's, it's really hard for me to sort of quantize this or prove it scientifically, but have you ever noticed that as soon as you look at a girl, uh, the girl, always knows that there's somebody who's looking at them. It never happens to a guy. It's, it's, it's intuition. It's, it's, I, have, I have no idea what it is, but it's like as soon as you look at the girl and you, you're looking at her for some time, she immediately looks back at you and, and guys normally look at the watch or somewhere else and then they, they sort of have a side face and then they look back at them, but then it's, it's, it's this very common social phenomenon that happens. So at, at that point, thanks to the the gazing book that I read. Uh, so back to the scene. Uh, I, 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 I went up to the counter girl and I told her, listen, that's my girlfriend right up there. And we've just had the biggest fight and she doesn't want to sit with me. So can we please sit together? So then, and can you please give her a free business class upgrade as well? 
so now uh, as soon as she, uh, and, and, and mentally I was sending all those frequencies in my head that yeah okay she's gonna look at me she's gonna look at me she's gonna, and through a sea of people uh, the counter girl it was viewable that she saw both of us looking at each other and acting as total strangers which we were but then she sort of saw some sort of chemistry which I don't know what what was believable to her and stuff and then she actually upgraded us to business class so we, there we were sitting together uh, I actually don't want to dwell in too much deeply into the conversations that we actually had because that's going to be the subject of my next TED talk <laughs> top five dumbest opening liners in the history of the universe <laughs> to use when encountered with a beautiful girl uh, so but nevertheless uh, the one thing that I actually sort of hold really close to my heart from that particular incident is that first of we both are best friends today and uh, she asked me this one question and when I was 19 she said what are you passionate about as strangely as it sounds it sort of was in like a like a opening and something that I actually like thought about I was like okay so I'm doing my engineering right now but I don't know I, I find films and music to be something that I'm really 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 passionate about so that's actually uh, the first thing that I would actually say uh, which is true passion. I mean, if you want to start anything and absolutely anything, especially films, uh, you would have to be super passionate about it. Plus, you have to be a bit of a fruit to actually start. So, uh, uh, which is why the entire connotation towards it. Uh, also, this is a very, very common myth in the space that you have to be extremely talented or you have to have some sort of a creative gift uh, to make films or start anything in the creative space. It's actually if you're passionate enough about it then and you the, the term I like to use is manic obsession, like you really, really are can only think about it and can not think about anything else. And automatically since you're manically obsessed about it, you would devote enough time to it as well. So as soon as you devote enough time to it, that pretty much equals talent. So everybody in this room uh, is as talented as I am or any of the speakers. It's it's just how manically obsessed you are and how much time would you be willing to give to it. And the best case scenario is actually you sort of take the same thing and actually make it into your own profession. Uh, so yeah, the, I, I, I got along with a couple of my friends who were manically or as crazy or as fruity as I was. and. Uh, we started our own ad film production house. Luckily for us, uh, the space turns out to be perfect for something like this. So why ad films is unlike features, which you would have to script and go through an entire process and you need the money, you have no idea how to start off with, especially for an engineering graduate like me, I have absolutely no formal training in films. So the traditional approach would be to go to a film school, work for a for huge production house for about 10 years. So basically, unlike features, the final film can actually be seen in a week, so it's instant gratification. So uh, I'd actually beg to differ from my previous speaker who said delay your gratification. Uh, I I sort of am the more I need it right now sort of scenario. Uh, literally zero investment in, is required to begin. You just need a laptop, a, a, a phone with internet connection, and that's about it. You you absolutely need nothing uh, else to actually make films. Manpower required is absolutely zero as well. Uh, and as soon as you land up a project, you it's it's on a freelance basis. You can hire a studio is nice to have, but not required at all. You can actually start your own film production house from your own house, uh, which is how we actually started. And the amazing thing is, uh, at least in Singapore, in the market, minimum television commercial budgets are about 100 sing hundred k sing dollars. Uh, that's that's a decent start because this is smack the minimum rock bottom price. Um, unfortunately, or, or thankfully, our predecessors have been supremely expensive to all the brands. So the brands actually think that getting a film is somewhat of a novelty. So they are ready to invest that much amount of money, which is, which is really good news for somebody who wants to start up business in the same space. Uh, minimum advance is around 50%. Normally, nowadays, producers have got even more greedier. They, they charge around 75% advance. So it's not that even you're, you're shelling out any money from you. you get the advance from the client to shoot a project. Profit margins are huge, 25%. Uh, 
Uh, it's exciting. You can travel to all the stunning locations in the world. Uh, you get to be get to meet beautiful people. It's, it's glamorous. It's fast-paced because every week you're running around the world and you're actually shooting a whole bunch of commercials. It's you, you can shoot about four to five in a month. Uh, so for me, at least, uh, it's without barring the manic obsession of it. It's it's super gifting as well at the same point of time. Highly satisfying. Uh, I'd just like to touch about a couple of approaches that one could use. But the traditional approach like I touched about is you work in an ad agency or you work in a film production house for about 10 years, go to film school. But I, I'd i like the shortcut route to it. So as a producer, like how I said, you start off from your house, uh, start watching a whole bunch of commercials. You, you figure out that who are the directors were actually shooting something like this. Represent the really, really famous ones, get their reel, somehow get in touch with them through now so the advent of social networking, you can actually get in touch with them very, very soon. Take their reel, network with ad agencies and represent, and then you can score huge projects. So it's as simple as that. It's, it's, it's not rocket science at all. Uh, the director's approach would be slightly more trickier. Uh, the director's approach is actually to shoot scratch ads if you, if you want to enrich and you don't want to represent somebody else's reel. You would have to shoot scratch ads as in Dummy ads, mock-up ads that actually do not cost anything. Uh, just take a digital camera by yourself and then whichever brand you like actually go ahead and shoot an ad for it. Uh, ideal scenario would be you actually tie up with a copywriter from an ad agency or a creative director so that as soon as they see their project getting into fruition, they automatically have the goodwill in you so they would, they would trust a money project next time around to you. And the, the last and the most exciting actually, uh, virals and social media, which there's a science to it as well. Everybody who is pretty much thinking that if you just plug in your webcam and then shoot baby videos and animal videos and uh, anything that's exciting, magic, uh, which we'll have later, uh, all, all, all these videos do really, really, really well in, during, in internet or while. But, at least from my perception uh, till now, it, it's not reached a stage where it can be monetized to an extent where you can actually forego traditional media and replace it with actually just just doing violence. So wait for it to actually like climb up, but it's a hugely exciting phase and a whole bunch of stuff is happening in it. Uh, I actually like to end with I I sometime back I actually saw one of my favorite TED talks by Seth Gordon who who talks about this purple cow of marketing. So uh, we produce something, uh, at least our humble attempt towards the purple cow of marketing. It's, it's for an Indian brand which makes potato chips called Bingo. So yeah, hope you like it. And thank you. The great Indian middle class. About 40% of India's population consists of it. That's 40% of a billion people. You can do the math. Indian middle class loves to bargain and wants more and more value for money. We wanted to tell people that Bingo Premium Salted Potato Chips was offering 25% of extra chips in every 5 rupee bag. Now how do you get them to buy your brand when every other snack brand claims to offer extra? How do you communicate when the media is bombarded with promotional advertising? How do you break the clutter and be heard? That was our challenge. Thanks to Indian Railways, we were able to do just that. <laughs> Railways is the lifeline of India. About 11 million people travel by train every day. Majority of the trains are inevitably running late. People wait for long hours at stations and a lot of snacking happens during this day. Here was a captive audience waiting to be targeted. We decided to use a medium that was never explored. The Indian Railways public address system. It took some convincing, but Indian Railways were a good sport. While people were waiting for their train, we used the public address system and announced in the same tone and manner that railways do.
normal. Unsuspecting people thought that this was a regular announcement until our trademark Boeing sound was hit. These announcements were carried out at select radio stations. Besides many a hearty laughs, we also got a 32% increase in our volume sales. People either missed the message, nor their trade. 